Hello, my friends. Welcome again to the weekly podcast of The Wise Idea with Christopher J. Harris. I am your host, and uh, I'm very honored, very excited that you've tuned in to today's episode. Yeah, man, we are rolling. We're rolling. We're getting information out. We're getting wisdom out. We're getting inspiration out. And one of the most flattering things, humbling things, is when I get comments back from those that are listening to the podcast and they say, oh, you inspire me so much. Inspiring is my life's mission. Inspiring wisdom is my life's mission. And I'm so excited to be able to use this platform to be able to bring incredible content to you every single week. And if you're new to the podcast, welcome to the party. Man, what's up? Glad to have all of you hanging out with us every single week. Our goal is to inspire everyday people to live wise lives. We also want to provide strategies for hearts to be inspired and heads to become wise. Guess what, guys? We are now in the month of June, and all this month, we're focusing on fathers, on fatherhood. Last month, we had a great time talking about moms and motherhood and what does that look like in today's culture and context. We had incredible guests on all month long, incredible conversations and dialogue and discussions, and I'm looking forward to this month as well. Let's just be honest, y'all. Dads don't get enough credit. The, the dads that have not been doing what they should be doing have been dominating the conversation and dominating the narrative, and I just believe, and I think the numbers are bearing it out, the statistics are bearing it out, that there are way more dads out there that are handling their business, and it's due time that we give them their credit. This month, I want to look at what does fatherhood look like? What does fathering and being a dad look like? What does it look like to, to, to have a village around um, our our sons and our daughters to make sure that they have what they need? It's, it's going to be so much fun. It's going to be so exciting. Well, guess as guess what? As we as we look at our Four, four prong approach, our four prong priorities, life, leadership, family and marriage and ministry. This whole notion of dads, I think, impacts every single one of those. We can see the reality of that in every single facet and area of our life. And uh, make no mistake about it. I believe that when wisdom becomes a part of your life, your entire life gets better. And in this case, when wisdom becomes a part of our society, our entire society gets better. Really fast, guys, I want to invite you, please, if you're on iTunes or Google Play, go over to those platforms and leave us a rating and a review. We desperately need your help. Can you help us spread the word? Will you sign on to be an ambassador, uh, to be a part of our tribe, to tell other people about this incredible platform and podcast? Of course, all of our notes and resources are available every single week. You can go to the wiseideapodcast.com. You can see other episodes there and even more. And of course, you can also email us at info at the wiseideapodcast.com with questions, ideas, and thoughts. If you're not already subscribed, this is your personal invitation to subscribe so that we can get right in your inbox. Well, today, um, I'm actually going to share a message with you guys that I did a few months ago around men and uh, what does it mean, uh, mean to recover from injury. And I think you're going to be uh, provoked and challenged by the message and even the story, the biblical story that I use as the backdrop for today's message is going to be inspiring to you. So get your notepads out, get your pens ready, get your glass of water, a cup of coffee or tea, whatever your pleasure. And uh, let's just just let's just jump in and enjoy the episode for today. Today, we're going to dig deep and talk about what does it mean and how do we recover from injury? How do we recover from injury? How do we recover from injury? Make no mistake about it, ladies and gentlemen, that we all have faced some sort of trauma in our lives. We all have faced some sort of trauma in our lives. It's, it's easy for us to see the physical trauma when there are bruises, black eyes that someone can physically see. It's a little less difficult to identify when a heart has been broken or bruised. It's a little bit harder for us to understand when a mind has been broken or bruised or a mind has trauma. It's a little bit heavier 
and harder to distinguish when a soul or a spirit has been damaged. But today we want to talk about it. We want to look in God's Word and find answers. We want to look at practical wisdom and insight to see what God will want to say to us today because make no mistake about it, and you will hear me repeat this phrase over and over and over again today, that God has a plan for our lives where he wants us healed, healthy, and whole. God has a plan for our lives where he wants us healed, healthy, and whole. God has a plan for our lives where he wants us healed, healthy, and whole. This notion, this notion of trauma is intensified in a significant way when it involves our family and close friends. It's intensified in a real way because our expectation is that those closest to us would not also be the hands of those that abuse us or cause some of our deepest traumas. Reverend Dr. M. R. DeHaan said, the nearest thing to heaven on earth is a happy Christian home, which is to infer that probably the closest thing to hell on earth is when you experience trauma in your home. So that you don't walk out of here confused about what trauma is as we define that, let me give you a working definition for it based on the American Psychiatric Association. They define trauma as a traumatic event that is an experience in which individuals fear for their lives or the lives of those close to them. Trauma, traumatic event, is an experience in which individuals fear for their lives or the lives of those close to them. To add to that, it is when our normal coping mechanisms are overwhelmed. When our normal coping mechanisms are overwhelmed. Uh, When a child falls and scrapes their knees, if their coping mechanisms have not been matured enough, you would think to them that the world is falling apart. But for an adult, they will see that scrape and they will say, it's going to be okay. You're going to recover. When our normal coping mechanisms are overwhelmed. Think about it in these terms. All of us, most of us have dealt with a computer or a device that freezes. We're trying to work. We're trying to get stuff done. We're trying to be productive. But the circle of death starts spinning. Guess what? The computer's coping mechanisms are overwhelmed. And we're frozen. We're stuck in the process. Well, this is what happens to us spiritually, mentally, emotionally, psychologically. When trauma happens in our life, our coping mechanisms, our processes get stuck. And we don't know what to do. And so what ends up happening, we end up getting into situations and circumstances and realities where we resort to unhealthy behaviors and responses, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder. We start uh, participating in unhealthy behaviors like alcoholism and other things that could create addictions. We start having emotional roller coasters where we respond in ways that are not really a part of really who we are. We start experiencing things in our lives that we said that we would never do or operate in ways that we said that we would not, never operate. We start adopting an identity that is not the identity that God wants us to have. And so when we look at all of these dynamics, the question becomes, what is the solution to all of this? I had a conversation this week, several conversations with several friends who are in self care fields, psychologists and counselors and social workers. And and I shared with them sort of what I felt like God was saying for this message. And I said, tell me some things that you think I need to definitely include. One of those folks that I talked with was Natalie Southward. She's a member of our church. She's a trained, certified, faith-based counselor. And she said to me, here's a couple things that I want you just to let them know. Number one, that your trauma can range from being mild to being totally debilitating. That, that your trauma, traumatic symptoms are highly individualized, which leads to this major point that you can't ever get to a place in your life where you compare your pain to somebody else's. She went on to tell me that when you compare your pain to someone else's, that, that it puts you in a place where you literally adopt a victim's mentality, which forces you and puts you in a cycle where you often can't get free from having a victim's mentality. And it's dangerous when you start comparing your pain to someone else's pain because your dynamics are not the same as their dynamics. 
And God did not make us to be victims. He made us to be victors. That he has a story, a plan for our lives to be happy, healthy, and whole. Here's the major point that all of them said in different conversations. As you understand and hear about trauma, just know that all trauma is treatable. Just know that all trauma is treatable. There is nothing that you can face in life that will cause traumatic experience in your life that is not treatable. That's good news. Because one of the major things you got to walk away with, I've said it four times already, and I'm going to say it more times before this message is done, that God has a plan for our lives where he wants us healthy and whole. God has a plan for our lives where he wants us healthy and whole. Let me give you a few scriptures to understand this picture even better. In Jeremiah chapter number 29, verse 11, God is talking to the prophet Jeremiah. He's early in his ministry, early in his identity and understanding that God had a plan for his life. And God felt like he needed to give Jeremiah handles to be able to understand the magnitude of God's assignment on his life. And watch what God tells Jeremiah. He says, for I know the plans that I have for you. Declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. Yes, plans for us. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22. The blessing of the Lord makes rich and he adds no sorrow with it. Not rich in terms of uh, material possessions where you're going to have an over, overflowing bank account, but rich in that all of your physical and emotional and spiritual needs are taken care of. And watch this. The second part of the verse is just as important as the first. Because as God blesses us, this verse sends the clear message that you never have to scheme or lose your character to get God's blessing. You never have to demise or, or mess up somebody else's life to get somebody else's blessing. So you don't need to walk out of here saying or believing or jumping on Facebook or Instagram saying to somebody else that's married, well, that's my man and I'm going to get him. Oh, that's my girl and I'm going to get them. No, that can't be yours if they belong to somebody else. The blessing of the Lord makes us rich and adds no sorrow with it. When God blesses you, it won't be a burden. Oh, that's so good right there. Let me give you a few more scriptures to understand this. Romans chapter number five, verse number eight, it says this. Watch this, that even God knows that we have needs and he makes provision for those needs even before we were born. Watch this. It says, but God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We were still selfish in our mess, doing our own thing, not even thinking about God. And yet God had already made a plan, a provision to get us out of our mess even before we needed to get out of our mess. So guess what? When you put the DVD of your life into the DVD of your mind and you press with wine and you look back over your life, you will see God's hand working to get you out of your mess even before you wanted to get out of your mess. God has a plan for your life. He wants you healthy and whole. John chapter 10, verse 10, for the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. The, zo the, the Zoe, the life that he talks about there, the Amplified Bible says, to the full, till it overflows. I want you to be so entrenched in me that every part of your life has my fingerprints over it. When you look at your relationships, when you look at your job, when you look at your mental stability, when you look at your finances, when you look at your interactions, when you look at your joy, your happiness, your gladness, even your face should show that my hand is on your life. My hand is on your life. So when you're walking around looking like a prune, it's hard to convince people that God's hand is on your life. Look at your neighbor and say, you ought to smile sometime. You ought to smile sometime. You ought to smile sometime. Look at this verse here, guys. I love this. The tenderness, the tenderness of this verse here. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, look at this. He says, cast all your anxieties, your worries, your pressures on him. Watch this. For he cares for you. When you study this verse out in the original language, you get the clear picture of a child cozying up to their parent. 
Even though the parent may not have all the answers that they provide to the child in that moment, the child has confidence that the parent has their best interest in mind, for he cares for you. He cares for you. Third John, verse 2, he says, Beloved brothers and sisters, I pray, I wish above all things, my heart's desire is that you are prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. The translation that you probably see up there says, hey, I, I, I want you to be as healthy in body as you are strong in spirit. God has a plan for your life. He doesn't just want you to prosper in your job. He doesn't want you just to have good relationships. He wants every part of your life to thrive. And one of the worst things that you and I could do is to compartmentalize our lives. Why? Because watch this. We are spirit with a soul that lives in a body. We are spirit that has a soul that lives in a body. So in other words, if you just take care of your body, but you don't even think about your soul or your spirit, your life is still going to be jacked up. If you worry about your spirit, but don't worry about your soul and don't take care of your body, your life still won't be healthy and whole. God says, hey, give all of yourself to me. Because watch what he says here. And Matthew, they don't have this verse. I'm flying off the cuff. This is a fact from heaven. Watch this. He says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world, but then lose his soul. Lose his soul. You got this other stuff. But you're not let me touch the deepest part of you. No, I have a plan for your life, and I want to be able to touch off every, every part of it. So what's the solution? How do we look at this in Scripture? What does Scripture and the Word provide for us in terms of solutions? And I've got about six minutes to give you a summary of a verse that sounds like a soap opera in the Bible. I promise you I want you to open your Bible and read along with me because if you weren't here today and somebody told you this story was in the Bible, you would probably doubt it if you hadn't read this before. But I want to introduce you to a guy by the name of David. Many of you may have heard him before, heard of him before. He's King David. He's King David. The Bible says he's, he's a man after God's own heart. He's, he's a warrior. He's a king. He's a worship leader. A majority of the book of Psalms is written by him. He's the same one that wrote, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He's the same one that, that, that wrote that I can look to the hills from which comes my help. All of my help comes from the Lord. But guess what? He's, he's thriving. He's winning as a warrior, as a king, as a worship leader. But he's failing as a father. He's failing privately. He's winning publicly, but he's failing privately. And we get a glimpse of a few moments, one season of his life that serves as a catalyst where he fails. Second Samuel chapter 13. Join me there because I want you to see, and I'm going to actually take the time to read it because some of y'all, you wouldn't read it at home anyway if I told you to. Watch what he says in verse one. Read along with me. If you got to say, I got it. If you're still trying to find it, say, wait, please. All right, everybody's got it. Praise God. Now, verse 1, David's son, Absalom, had a beautiful sister named Tamar. And Amnon, her half-brother, fell desperately in love with her. Amnon became so obsessed with Tamar that he became ill. A clear picture of being lovesick, that you're so in love with somebody that you get sick. Any of y'all ever been there before? She was a virgin, and Amnon thought he could never have her. But Amnon had a very crafty friend, his cousin, named Jonadab. Jonadab. He was the son of David's brother, Shemia. One day, Jonadab said to Amnon, what's the trouble? Why should the son of a king look so dejected morning after morning? And right here, let me say parenthetically that this verse proves to us that even if you have material possessions, it doesn't mean that all of your needs are met. Because here we see that Abnon and Absalom are sons of the king and they have everything in the natural that they could ever ask for. But they're getting ready to make some decisions to jack their whole life up. Watch this. I'm now right before verse 3. So Amnon told him, I am in love with Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Well, Jonadab said, I'll tell you what to do. Here's the plot. Go back to bed and pretend you are ill. 
When your father, the king, comes to see you, ask him to let Tamar come and prepare some food for you. Tell him you'll feel better if she prepares it as you watch and feeds you with her own hands. Verse 6, so Amnon lay down and pretended to be sick. And when the king came to see him, anytime you see trauma going on in a family, somebody's pretending somewhere. Amnon asked him, please let my sister Tamar come and cook my favorite dish as I watch. Then I can eat it from her own hands. Verse 7, so David agreed, the king agreed, and sent Tamar to Amnon's house to prepare some food for him. Verse 8, when Tamar arrived at Amnon's house, she went to the place where he was lying down so he could watch her mix some dough. Then she baked his favorite dish for him. Verse 9, but when she set the serving tray before him, he refused to eat. Everyone get out of here, Amnon told his servants. So they all left. The devil loves to dwell in secrets and silence. He loves to dwell in secrets. Oftentimes when trauma has happened in our life, he wants us to keep it a secret so that we can remain in bondage. Watch this, verse 10. Then he said to Tamar, now bring the food into my bedroom and feed it to me here. So Tamar took his favorite dish to him. Verse 11, but as she was feeding him, he grabbed her and demanded, come to bed with me, my darling sister. He's about to rape his sister. Verse 12, no, bro- no, my brother, she cried. Don't be foolish. Don't do this to me. Such wicked things aren't done in Israel. Where could I go in my shame? Shame. And you would be called one of the greatest fools in Israel. Please just speak to the king about it, and he will let you marry me. But Amnon wouldn't listen to her. Verse 14, and since he was stronger than she was, he raped her. Then suddenly Amnon loved, Amnon's love turned to hate, and he hated her even more than he had loved her. Get out of here, he snarled at her. Verse 16, no, no, Tamar cried. Sending me away now is worse than what you've already done to me. But Amnon wouldn't listen to her. Watch this. He shouted for his servants and demanded, throw this woman, not his sister anymore, not by name, but throw this woman, an object out, and lock the door behind her. Verse 18, so the servants put her out and locked the door behind her. She was wearing a long, beautiful robe, as was the custom of those in the days for the king's virgin daughters. I'm going to stop there. One of the most challenging things about this story is that it doesn't have a happy ending. If you go, this I would encourage you to go do in your own time and read chapters 14, 15, 16 through 19. You will discover that it's all downhill from here. That literally, watch this, watch this, watch this. That Absalom finds out about his brother raping the sister and gets so mad that he plots for two years to kill his brother. Draws his brother to a party, gets his brother drunk, kills his brother. Then he goes on the run for three years. The dad, David, king, ignores them. Calls for Absalom to come back, brings him back into Israel, but doesn't speak to him. Absalom takes that to heart. Absalom then plots to take his dad's kingdom, gets his soldiers fighting against his dad's soldiers. Finally, as the soldiers are fighting each other, uh, the Bible says that Absalom is riding on his horse and doesn't see this lower hanging tree. He gets caught by this tree, and the Bible says that the tree is hanging. He's, his body is dangling from the tree branch. One of David's soldiers sees Absalom hanging from this tree branch, takes three javelins, and comes and kills him while he's hanging from the tree. The Bible says that David mourned in a way that literally he ripped his clothes off, put ashes on his head, and starts running through the streets naked, crying because his son is dead. Amnon, Absalom is dead. Tamar is raped. And notice what happens. Notice what happens. That I'm going to give you some traumas here in a minute, but the very first trauma that started this domino effect was David having adultery, committing adultery in chapter 8 with Bathsheba. Pastor Christopher, why in the world would you give us such a horrible story like this without a happy ending? You know we love happy endings. Well, this story, this part of the story doesn't have a happy ending. But when you read the whole narrative, you still see where Jesus, our Savior, came through David's lineage. God has a plan for our lives. 
that he wants us healed, healthy, and whole, that Jesus came through the lineage of David. Let me show you all a few traumas here that you see in this story. The first trauma, of course, is that David planted this seed in his family. And I'm going to talk about this in just a moment, but let me just say it now because I feel it now. Parents, hear me. Adults, hear me. Everything that we do plants a seed. Either a good seed or a bad seed. Everything that we do plants a seed. Either a good seed or a bad seed. You may not think it's a big deal, but when you go to that restaurant and you tell the people at the cash register, I just want a cup of water. But then you go to the machine and you actually get a drink. Your kids heard you say you were getting water, but they saw you get a drink. And so you plant a seed that lying is okay. When your kids see you lose your temper in the car because somebody cut you off. And that curse word comes out, it doesn't slip. It comes out. And you're saying to your kids that expressing anger in an unhealthy way is okay. When you pick your kids up from school, but you're on the phone talking bad about your boss in front of your kids, you're planting a seed that not respecting those in leadership is okay. Everything is a seed. Look at this trauma. The first trauma we see, trauma number one, is that Amnon rapes Tamar. Trauma number three is that we see, watch this, this is a critical point. Trauma number three, David does nothing. He finds out about the sin. He finds out about the rape, and he looks the other way. He does nothing about it. Trauma number four, that literally Absalom is plotting for Amnon's life. Trauma number five and number six is that Absalom introduced alcoholism to their family, gets Amnon drunk, and then kills his brother. Trauma number seven, that now Absalom has fled for his life. Again, David doesn't embrace his son and deal with the heaviness of the moment. Trauma number eight, Absalom finally comes back, but David refuses to offer him forgiveness. Trauma number nine, that when the time was right, Absalom plots a coup d'etat to take his father's throne. Trauma number 10, Absalom dies a horrible death. So when you hear this, what are just three or four things that you can pull from this story? Write these down really fast, and then I'm going to shift gears. Number one, number one, David doesn't appear to have admitted his own sins to his children. He doesn't appear to have admitted his own sins before his children. Now, hear me. I understand, parents. I understand that there are some things from our past that our children, depending on their age, are not ready to handle. But at the right time, at the right age, in the right setting, in the right way, parents, we have to be willing to share things that have impacted our lives that could impact our children with our children. When you've messed up, own it. When you've messed up, when you've made a bad decision, own it. Be willing to be mature enough and emotionally healthy enough with your children to say, listen, this is not who we are, but this is what happened. When this took place, when that took place, the worst thing you could do is never address it. Let me say this. Don't ever, ever underestimate the power of an apology. Don't ever, ever underestimate the power of an apology. When this happened, I'm sorry that I did this. Watch this. I have discovered as a dad, I've discovered as a dad that sometimes I may not have the full story. I may not have all the information and I could just move to get to a quick resolve. My wife and I, But we've resolved that if we miss it or if we make an error, that we're still mature enough, even though we're in charge of our home, to tell our children we miss it. Daddy, sorry, I messed up. Mama, sorry, we messed up. We'll own that. And guess what? When we do that, we teach our children bigger lessons than the mistake that we made. Number two, number two, David looked the other way when his children sinned. He looked the other way when his children sinned. And can I say this to you guys? I'm not just talking to parents. I'm talking to every adult 
that's in here today and every adult that's watching us online or that may watch this on demand, every adult, whether you have a blood child that you brought into this world or not, every adult, you and I have a responsibility. Hear me. Hear me. We have a responsibility to speak up when we see wrong. If you are a follower of of Christ and you see a child doing wrong in the grocery store or in a public place, even if it's not your child, speak up. You have a responsibility. And I don't have time today to show you all of the scriptures that show you why it's our responsibility. But you cannot be passive when you see children doing wrong. Well, that's not my child. I'll let their mama deal with it. I'll let their daddy deal with it. Or what happens if they treat me wrong or respond to me wrong? It doesn't matter. They are a child and you and I are adults. We have to speak up. Here's the last thing and probably the most important point for today. Is that nowhere in Scripture during this particular scenario do we see David asking and inviting God for guidance and help. I've discovered that we don't always intentionally exclude God from our family, but we don't always include him either. When something happens to our children, when something happens to our health, when something happens to our finances, we immediately try to go into solution mode. We immediately start trying to think of who can we call and what do I need to go and what is the answer? When can I be honest with you? Sometimes the best solution in the moment is to drop to your knees and say, God, I need your help. I need your help. I don't know what I'm going to do to pay these bills. God, I don't know what I'm going to do to deal with the fact that somebody wronged me or somebody hurt me or somebody violated me. God, I'm overwhelmed. Seems like when it rains, it pours, and I don't know what to do next. God, I need your help. We're so busy to run to Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, and we've got this soundbite theology. When life is not fixed through soundbite theology, Our lives are too complex and too layered for us to get fixed in 140 characters with cute hashtags. No, sometimes you got to sit down to do some hard work to get free. But make no mistake about it, God has a plan for our lives where he wants us healed, healthy, and whole. Wow, it was so much fun to share this information, this knowledge with you today about recovering from injury. Make no mistake about it. You heard it several times today that, in fact, God has a plan for your life and he wants you healed, healthy and whole. Please, ladies and gentlemen, particularly dads today, I want to invite you, dad, your sons, your daughters, they need you healthy. They need you Uh, whole. They need you complete. They need you focused. They need you thriving in life, not just existing. They don't need you going through the motions. They need you to be very intentional about the legacy that you leave and the impact that you're making on them and with them on a daily basis. And I hope today you were challenged to do that. Wherever you are, it's never too late to be what you should be. It's never too late to become what you always should be. And I want to invite you, go ahead, make whatever adjustments you got to make. Have the hard conversations, make the hard decisions, do the hard things and come out on the winning side. Thank you again for joining us for another episode of the Wise Idea Podcast with Christopher J. Harris. I hope that you have enjoyed our time together today. I hope you've taken a lot of notes and I hope you have gotten this message imprinted in your heart and your mind that God does have a plan for your life. He wants you healed, healthy and whole. You would like additional resources and information. You can, of course, find that information and more at thewiseideapodcast.com. I invite you to join the conversation on social media. On Twitter and Facebook, we are at The Wise Idea. On Instagram, we are at The Wise Idea Podcast. I also invite you to join us on Facebook. We have a Facebook group at The Wise Idea Podcast. 
And I personally am also on social media. You can catch me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Pinterest, all at CJ Harris O-N-E. Finally, again, here's another invitation for you. If you've enjoyed what, you, what you've heard, please head over to iTunes and Google Play. Leave a rating and a review for other listeners to be able to find us. We are also on Google Play and Stitcher and tune in. And I know that a majority of you, based on our numbers that are coming in, are listening to us on mobile. So thank you so much for tuning in every single week and helping us spread the word. Guys, we've got an incredible lineup this month around dads. Get some dads that you know, some fathers that you know. They're going to be encouraged, inspired, uplifted, motivated. They're going to get some pats on the back because of the work that they're already doing. Have them tune in to the Wise Idea this month. It's going to be really, really good. We would also love to hear from you directly. If you want to send us an email with questions, ideas, or thoughts, or even recommendations of guests or topics to cover, please feel free to send us an email at info, I-N-F-O, at thewiseideapodcast.com. Thank you again for joining us this week. We look forward to having you tune in next week. And guess what I say every single week? Live wisely.